Um, so hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Save the Great South Bay's monthly webinar series on Bay Friendly Arts. My name is Robin Silvestri. I'm the executive director, of, I would say very proud executive director of the organization. I'm a huge advocate for water quality in the Bay and uh, happy to be here today. Um, we're very pleased to present this program today in collaboration with uh, five libraries across the South Shore of Suffolk County. Uh, Cold Spring Harbor, a little bit on the North Shore, Sayville Library, Patchogue Medford Library, Babylon Public Library, and Lindenhurst Memorial Library, who I always like to give an extra special shout out to, along with the Patrick Medford Library. Uh, Lindenhurst Library and Patrick Medford Library are Bay Friendly Yards. They're certified and uh, have recently incorporated butterfly gardens from our pollinator packs uh, into their gardens. Yay. So, yeah, I'm really excited for that. Um, that program has been going very well. So a little bit about our organization before we get started. Uh, huh. oh, there we go. Okay, great, thank you. Our organization is made up of over 17,000 uh, 17, yeah, South Shore residents, past and present, um, people just like you and me. We are paddle boarders, kayakers, fishermen, oyster farmers. Um, recreational boaters, um, business owners, and, and residents, residents who live on the South Shore, whose home values depend on the, uh, on the health of the Great South Bay. Nobody wants to live along a, a, a dead bay. And so uh, we were formed back in 2013 when two Sayville High School alumni returned, uh, returned back to the island and were just distraught over the state of the bay. It had been assaulted by brown tides caused by nitrogen uh, runoff um, into the bay and brown tides uh, greatly affect the uh, ability of sun to get through and then therefore affect all sorts of the life in the bay. So Save the Great South Bay was formed then and there as they vowed to protect and preserve the Bay. And our mission is to, to conduct programs and policies and promote policies that protect and preserve the Great South Bay. We were so also mentioned uh, just that uh, brown tides also lead to anoxia, uh, lacking oxygen, but go on. Sorry. Well, lacking oxygen, which leads to fish kills and, and uh, die offs of our seagrasses. Uh, our three main programs include the Creek Defender Program, by which we work together in, uh, in, with municipalities, local hyper-local organizations, civics, um, schools, elected officials, and others, as we patrol and identify areas in need along the 50 creeks that lead into the Great South Bay. These creeks are the arteries that lead into the bay, and the quality of the water in the bay is heavily dependent upon the water that enters it. Our second area of uh, work is the shellfish restoration. We proudly are working right now on the Great South Bay Oyster Project, whereby we're creating an oyster sanctuary out in the Great South Bay. Uh, one oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. And so we're looking to put uh, hundreds of millions of oysters back into the bay for their ecological function. And what we're here for today is the third leg of our stool is habitat restoration. And that is really our upland. So on the, on the mainland um, programs to restore habitat to what it was before we were here. Um, that leads me into our next slide. And our speaker, Frank Piccinini is our director of habitat restoration for our organization. He is also a biologist an environmental attorney and a passionate environmentalist who is dedicated to restoring functional habitat to our human impacted landscape. Frank has his JD from Hofstra and an additional um, degrees from Marshall University and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He is a partner and co-founder at Simple Consulting and Spadefoot Design and Construction through which he provides expert testimony for community and advocacy groups and habitat restoration services to private, public, and commercial clients. So welcome, Frank. Uh, this is our um, fourth uh, in edition of the Bay Friendly Yards webinar series, and always a, a pleasure to have you on as a speaker. And, and it's always a pleasure to be on as a speaker. And of all the topics we've covered so far, I have to say that this is probably my favorite. Um, I started really my, my career in environmentalism as a, a wildlife biologist. You never really lose that. Um, and I'm so pleased to be able to kind of connect uh, the habitat restoration to uh, the health of the, the bay. It's all interconnected in what we do here 
what you do on your land can really help. Um, so today, whoops, went, went way too far. So these are the three slides. If, if you've attended any of our other uh, presentations, you, you're probably uh, familiar with these at this point, but I, we think it's really good context to share. So I'm just gonna kind of take these three slides and, and kind of set the scene. So prior to 1900, Long Island was you know, the, this natural wonderland. It was, uh, the resources were incredible. Um, it was you know, largely untouched, dotted with some agricultural uses, but you know, nature was abundant. Um, there was a, a string of Atlantic white cedar swamps all the way from Montauk to Brooklyn. Giant grasslands in, in, in and around the Sayville area, also around the uh, Hampstead area, uh, which unfortunately are, have been reduced to really uh, vestigial populations of these grasslands. Um, and the Pine Barrens went all the way out past Nassau County, believe it or not. Um, so, it, so it was once a beautiful natural uh, world. Uh, and unfortunately, some of our uh, land use had, had, has kind of really decimated the health. It's still beautiful here on Long Island, um, but certainly the ecological structure and function has been impaired by human land, land use. So, oops. So how did that happen? Well, it's really unplanned growth and it really started uh, with Levittown. Um, so Levittown was really important for the GIs coming home. It, this, this thought of home ownership uh, was, was really important to folks and, and they deserved it coming back from the war. Um, however, um, we control by, in our efforts to control nature, we've really decimated, again, the structure and function. Um, you know, massive home building and just sprawl. Everything sprawled from the city on outward. And, and I really think that, uh, and, and a lot of scholars believe that Levittown really was sort of this epicenter of this way of life, the suburban way of life, where we have these postage, postage stamp yards with uh, green, fluorescent green lawns, a single tree and a cesspool. Um, so, you know, or two trees in the cesspool. You know, hardly this, this natural ecosystem that Long Island once consisted of. And then we kept going, uh, we kept building. And uh, again, development is, in and of itself is not a bad thing. Unplanned and unsustainable and, uh, and lacking conscientiousness development is problematic. And, and really we just, we replicated Levittown, but what's worse, we, we built up these strip malls all over Long Island that you know, unfortunately, you know, given COVID and, and even before that, uh, they, they, given the internet and the ability to order things on Amazon, we just don't need these strip malls anymore. And so we have you know, endless highways. You have to drive everywhere on Long Island for the most part, Long Island Railroad notwithstanding. Um, and you know, not to mention some of the industrial uses and, and a lot of these uh, horrifying plumes emanating from these former or current industrial facilities. Um, so so that's, that's the scary, cruddy part, um, but there's a lot of uh, positive here. But before we get to the positive, the, the results. So uh, unfortunately, this thousands of acres of natural habitat uh, replaced with just turf grass, which is from an ecological standpoint, is just lifeless. It's a lifeless monoculture. And from a stormwater standpoint, it's not very helpful either. Uh, people use fertilizers and pesticides to maintain the suburban nightmare. It says dream here. I view it as a nightmare. Um, people introduce invasive species and ornamental species. The ornamental species I'm less concerned with, but stuff, uh, the invasives have incredible impacts on the environment and relatedly on our economy, um, unfortunately. And, and a lot of these invasive plants were, were even planted by the municipalities, Norway maple being a great example. Um, oh, it's a fast growing tree. We should plant these things everywhere. And now they are everywhere on Long Island and, and they really degrade structure and function. And then not to mention the abundant nitrogen pollution associated with stormwater runoff and other contaminants such as heavy metals and phosphorus and so on. Uh, so we're rough on the environment, but uh, we can help. So this is what really bugs us. Uh, we are introducing all these uh, invasive plants, ornamental species, these monocultures of turf grass. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, we are not leaving any sort of landing pads, to, so to speak, for some of the, the bugs. And, you know, bugs are the cornerstone, the foundation of really our way of life. I mean, every, everything's way of life. Um, it's the critical trophic level between plants and animals. And without bugs, 
unfortunately, the economy just grinds to a halt. And then human life as we know it would grind to a, a halt. Uh, we, we wouldn't have pollinators to, to pollinate our food. Um, we wouldn't have birds. We wouldn't have um, ecosystems. Um, and everything we do, uh, everything that we do without really thought about the, about the bugs uh, is really uh, inch by, it's a death by a thousand cuts, as they say. And it, it's, it's, it's troubling. So how do we uh, how do we help? Well, I, we can build wildlife habitat, and and so this is sort of an extension of our Bay Friendly Yards program. We really want to uh, we want to draw attention to some of the cute critical uh, cute creatures that are critical. Um, and so yeah, here we have a tiger salamander and a spotted salamander. Um, and interestingly, uh, salamanders of the genus Ambystema, of which both of these species are. Um, were my thesis project uh, in graduate school. I did a lot of research on these. And most people on Long Island don't even know that these guys exist. Where they exist, where they're living, uh, they're, they're incredibly, um, incredibly locally abundant. Uh, and, and they're really, and they're, and they're critical in, in, in a couple of ways. One, um, given their uh, semi-permeable skin, um, as well as their, uh, their very complex habitat requirements, they're, they're thought of as uh, eco-indicators, uh, sort of the, the, the slimy uh, canaries in the coal mine, if you will. So to the extent that we're decimating amphibian populations, um, we're also, it, it really is kind of indicative of the decimation of uh, really the ecosystem in, in general. Um, and, these, and these creatures have an incredible biomass. Uh, and why is that significant? It's, it's the food source. Um, interestingly, if you add up all the, the volume of uh, salamanders, for example, within a forest, um, their, their biomass is gonna uh, be greater than all the mammals, all the birds, uh, everything except for bugs, uh, which is, if you think about it, it's mind boggling um, how locally dense these creatures can be. Uh, but if we continue to, to decimate the earth and not kind of support their habitats, uh, we're not going to have them anymore, um, and and that's really bad for us. Oops. And uh, the birds are another another sort of canary, literally the uh, canaries in the, in the coal mines here. Uh, it's a it's a chickadee here, and uh, there's a there's been a drastic uh, and well documented decline of bird populations, uh, approaching three billion or twenty nine percent of the population since 1970, and that's that's incredible, um, and it's and it's really attributable to what we're doing in these suburban settings. And, and what I mean by that is just the typical mow and blow landscaping style where you have one token tree, usually non-native, sometimes invasives, and, and, just, and just lawns that really don't do anything. So how can you help? Uh, you can help, as, as I suggested in earlier slides, just simply by creating wildlife habitat um, and, and really by enjoying the nature show. Uh, the, inter the fun part about uh, restoring your land and, and starting where you stand within your own property um, is that you, you can really grow connected to nature. And, and it's sort of addicting. Once you start to understand how interconnected human populations are with nature and how nature is not just that green space in between cities. Nature is all within a, in all of the land. You can't uh, untangle yourself from it. Um, so once you start to identify certain plants, uh, you start to identify certain pollinator species, you start to learn the bird songs, um, everywhere you go, you'll start to see it. And you'll start to see what's happening to, uh, to, the, to these uh, environments that, that it's, that's really troubling. So um, it's addicting and uh, one way to really just educating yourself and, and your kids most importantly, uh, will, will really help move the ball forward. Um, and so one thing to sort of consider is, uh, and, and this is a little bit of uh, uh, theory driven, but biodiversity versus diversity of interactions. Um, so historically, you know, when conservation biology, which is a, it's a relatively young science, really like 70s or the 80s, it really started kind of moving forward as an organized discipline. Uh, and, and the metric that a, a lot of scientists pointed to about the health of the environment was biodiversity. Basically, how many uh, species are in a given spatial area, just a, a sheer count. And the thought was that uh, the number of species uh, represented how healthy that environment was. Um, and, and what we're really starting to understand is that it's not just how many species you have, it's rather 
what is the diversity of interactions are, that are within the environment? So as an example, uh, let's go back to our, our little insects. Um, you know, insects are very, uh, a, lo a lot of these pollinators, for example, will only go to specific host plants to, to really, to rear their young. So the, the, the butterflies lay their eggs on specific host plants. The host plants um, are feed the caterpillars, and these caterpillars are feeding the birds, um, feeding uh, you know the spiders. The spiders are also being eaten by the birds, uh, and they're this is adding to nutrient cycling within the forest. And so nature just builds on itself, and uh, the sum of uh, you know this this the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. So it's not just how many species there are, but how many interactions between the species. And some of the points that we'll try to make here today will really help you to understand how within the, the context of even like a small quarter acre or a smaller yard, you really can build habitat. Um, so the first practical point is really to understand hydrology. Um, so, so just as, as noted here, soil texture, um, so basically, you know, the gritty, the sandiness of the soil, hydrology, uh, and sun exposure will all determine which plants will do well, and that's and that's pretty important. And so, the the nomenclature you should familiarize yourself with uh, is is laid out here: wetland obligates to uplands, um, upland species. So, wetland obligate species they need what's called hydric soils, and they need wet feet, so to speak. Um, whereas upland species they will not do well and will probably perish over time if they do have wet species, uh, wet feet. And facultative is in the middle. Um, and then there's plants that are shaded wet and they shade um, dry, but they're still adapted to both wet and dry situations. So um, understanding the hydrology and, and just this next slide, I think it's slightly blurry, uh, blurry but it sort of shows you um, this gradient that's really important um, to, to look at. So you look towards the right, there's uh there's obligate wetland here. I mean, can you guys see Robin? If you can just unmute for a second, can you see my arrow? Yes, we can see. Okay, her. great. Thank thank you. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. So um, obligate wetland species are down here, whereas obligate upland species are up here and in between facultative and and so on. And and interestingly, the difference between what's a wetland and what's an upland can change over a remarkably fine scale. Like I'm talking about two to three feet. You walk one spot in your squishy part of the lawn um, and that's quote unquote wetland. Uh, you walk a little bit further, you know, maybe it rises two or three inches and now you're in the upland. Um, and so it's really, it's incredible like how much the, these gradients are, are, can be established within even the small yard. I mean, the trick is just to kind of observe your yard, see where the soupy spots are and plant facultative wetland species, and then find the dry spots and plant upland species. Um, and, and that, and later on, we'll kind of, I'll give you an example, going back to my favorite salamander uh, taxa, uh, about why this is important, why this is really building habitat. Um, and so another thing that you can kind of uh, try to do to build habitat um, is something referred to as vertical layering. Um, so if, if you go into a thriving, healthy forest, there's, there's a number of layers in there. Um, so, you know, the overstory, really the canopy species, the understory, uh, the shrubs, and the herbaceous layer. You can kind of see it on uh, over here. Uh, and this is a, a, really good, a really good diagram. And it's this layering, this vertical layering that exists that really helps this establish what's called the diversity of interactions again. Um, and so when you're replanting a, a portion of your yard, giving it back to nature, uh, developing your own homegrown national park. You really should be uh, aware of planting combinations of species that will help facilitate this layering. Uh, and so, you know, just to give an example, uh, just to bring it home to Long Island, uh, there's a lot of pitch pine oak forests and uh, some species that kind of uh, contribute to the layering are as follows. So the oaks are, are really uh, the canopy species. Uh, they, they, go, they go straight up. Um, they, they reach to the sky and really form this incredible and important canopy um, in the atmosphere. And then you can plant some things like an American beech. American beech is an, also an incredible species in the same family, Fagiaceae. Um, however, um, instead of the, them growing up, their life strategy is that they sort of grow out. Um, they grow out and reach for the sunlight under the little spots where maybe the oaks have little, there's little holes in the oak canopy. 
Um, and so that's the that, that's sort of this this mid story layer. Um, and below that are species like uh, dogwoods and and chokeberries, um, stuff that will not grow too high, will never reach the canopy, and is most happy um, in this mid layer. Um, and then you have the shrub layer, things like arrowwood viburnum, uh, bayberries at times, although they're not as good in the in the shade, they're more on the edge, but uh, blueberries, high bush blueberry is another good one that could live in the shrub layer. And then in the ground layer are things like ferns, grasses, and spring ephemeral flowers. So uh, when you're planting, plant in clusters of trees, uh, plant trees of different species that will start to uh, grow into layering over time. Uh, and then make sure you have the ground cover, although that's probably last in, in the sense because uh, if you really, if you establish the canopy, the mid-story layer and the shrub layer, the spring ephemerals will come. The earth has this incredible ecological memory to it and uh, the seed bank will be there. You have to be uh, aware of which of the invasive species and, and selectively edit over time, but it's really important for even in a small quarter acre lot, like the one I grew up on, you can find a patch in your yard to plant clusters of trees and shrubs and so on. And, and you can really facilitate habitat. And, and if you think about it, um, the, the entire South shore of Long Island, uh, it's, it's primarily quarter acre lots are smaller. And uh, if we all do a small little habitat patch in our yard, uh, can you imagine how much habitat there'd be for birds and so on in, in the aggregate? It'd be a lot. Um, so, so pay attention to your vertical layering. Oh, okay. And then horizontal layering. Um, so uh, this is a rendering I did for, for one of my clients for Spadefoot Design and Construction, but I, I wanted to show this because it really, I think it's sort of indicative of what you can do on your land to really facilitate layering. So before I even talk about horizontal layering, uh, I, I just wanted to point out um, in the back here, you have a, a lot of the oaks and maples and some pitch pine that we uh, plan on incorporating into this property. And then here you have chokeberry, which will create the second layer of the forest. Um, and then you have a lot of blueberries, there's a beach plum right here, some arrowwoods and so on uh, in this shrub layer. And then at the bottom, you have, uh, you have some herbaceous species, uh, ground cover type plants. Um, so you know, this, this is interesting layering and it really, I think shows how one can really restore habitat within just a, a, a standard, uh, you know, lot. I mean, this is a little bit of a bigger lot, but still it doesn't have to be, you know, a giant patch for it to make a very significant difference, especially if all of your neighbors are doing it too. Um, so that's the vertical layering that I kind of just showed you here, but also there's this horizontal layering. Um, so basically what we want to try to do is facilitate ecotones. Um, ecotones, you know, transitions between biological communities. Now, this lawn right here uh, is not really a, a biological community for the most part. It's just sort of, uh, it's just sort of there. Um, but I have lawn. My little kiddo runs around in it and loves it. Uh, but we also bite off the lawn at the margins. And and where you can, you try to cr plant bigger things towards the back, um, and then grade it forward uh, as as you're getting to the opening in the canopy. And this sort of mimics. Um, edges in forests and also, uh, you know, where, where there's maybe some, a tree falls, an old tree falls due to wind throw or, or something, some storm, a microburst comes in and it takes out a big oak in the middle of the forest. You have this, this, this transition between uh, that starts to develop and along these transitions, that's one of the most, these are the most productive areas in a forest. Of course, you know, the forest itself is important, but the transition is almost as important uh, if not more important, because it really, really facilitates a diversity of interactions. Um, and again, it can be done in your backyard in a small quarter acre or smaller uh, uh, yard. Again, like where I grew up in North Massapequa. Um, and why is it important? Going back to our, our friends here, the tiger salamander, which again exists on Long Island, um, and the spotted salamander, which looks very similar, also exists on Long Island. Uh, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nerd out a little bit about salamanders because uh, I, I love them and I don't often get to talk about them. So, you know, you'll have to bear with me on that. Uh, and so these creatures are incredible. You think about them in, or a lot of people think about them in, in, their, in terms of vernal pools. Uh, so, so basically fishless puddles in the middle of a forest where they breed. 
Uh, and the reason why you have a lot of people have this association in their mind is because that's when you see them. Um, so they breed in these ephemeral pools and, and they, they actually will go back to their own ephemeral pool, but they don't live there. Um, for the vast majority of the year, they live in the upland terrestrial environment surrounding the vernal pools. Um, and these critters have been tracked using uh, radio telemetry, believe it or not, to have been moving to move over a thousand meters away from their, their natal pool, the pool where they were born. Um, and, they, and they go and find abandoned uh, small mammal burrows um, in the uplands, in the drier uplands. They live underground for the vast majority of the year. They come out and forage during really heavy rainfalls, but for the most part, they live underground. And you can walk over the same patch of forest uh, you know, every single day during the summer and the spring and so on. And unless you're in, at that patch of forest uh, in, in the very right time, uh, in, in the very right place, you know, it's, for these species, they're spring breeders. Uh, so they come out, uh, with, you know, probably about three, four weeks late for them right now, but they come out during uh, heavy rainstorm events in the, in the, in the spring. Um, and what's incredible is that these critters, uh, you know, if you're at that patch of woods that you've walked over a million times at the right time, uh, these things come pouring out of the hillsides. It's, it's almost, you know, my gosh, I didn't even know these were here. Uh, and, and now there's thousands of them around me. Where did they come from? And they, they walk all the way to their vernal pools. They, they do their thing. They breed. They have their little party in the spring. Um, and they'll walk back to the same abandoned rodo, uh, rodent burrow that they lived in. Uh, think about that. A salamander will come out of this, uh, this rodent burrow, walk a thousand meters, go breed, and walk back to that same rodent burrow. Um, and, and so why am I telling you about the natural history of these, these creatures? Uh, really just to illustrate how important it is to uh, have this, these concepts such as uh, wetland upland gradients and also uh, the layering. Um, so right, the, the, without the wetland, they can't breed. Uh, they, they, their populations will not survive. Without the upland, they have no place to overwinter. They have no place to spend the summer. They have no place to find food. Uh, and, and without the layering, they're, they're going to get picked off by predators or desiccate in the sun because the layering really um, maintains a moist uh, understory and, and a microclimate that's adequate for these creatures to survive and to thrive. Um, so, so I'm just trying to put it back together for you and, and, and illustrate with these amazing creatures that, again, are abundant on Long Island, at least in some places, um, that we, we, you really have to kind of consider all of these factors. But again, it's not that hard and you can do it on a small quarter acre lot. And I keep saying that because I don't want people to think that you have to have acres and acres and acres to create wildlife habitat. Um, a little patch will do. Even if you don't wanna plant trees and you just plant a patch of milkweed for the monarch butterflies, if everybody had a patch of milkweed, the monarchs would have places to land and eat and, to, and so on. Um, so thank you for hearing my, my chat about salamanders. I can obviously I can talk about these critters all day, uh, but I will not torture you anymore. Um, so some other practical tips just to kind of go over. Um, phenology, so, so kind of uh, considering um, having resources available uh, at all times of the year. Uh, phenology is really just the study of this, the cyclical patterns of biological processes. Uh, but we talked about this in the pollinator, creating pollinator gardens uh, presentation about having flowers that are blooming in the spring, spring ephemerals, having things that, you know, like the viburnums that I mentioned before that bloom right about this time of the year, they're just about to start to pop. Um, and then to have uh, summer bloomers, things like Joe Pieweed, and to finish off with fall blooming beauties like um, seaside goldenrod or some of the other um, goldenrod species. Uh, but also, you know, don't forget about um, having, having food available for the critters in the winter. Pictured here is uh, Ilex verticulata, which is uh, winterberry. Uh, it gets its name for obvious reasons. It it's, it's, creates this red winter interest in, in the winter. And it really, you know, I love planting these things on the projects that I work on and in my own yard, uh, because when it's snowing and you have this red against the snow, it's really striking, but also they're an incredibly important food source for birds. I and mean, they're not terribly nutritious. So that's why they're still there in the winter. Uh, but when these critters are desperate for something to eat, they're really happy that you have winterberry. So really phenology, consider um, having resources available for the wildlife throughout the year. Um, and leaves are not litter. Uh, it, it drives me nuts. Um, I, just a, a little aside, um, 
one of my favorite bird species uh, is a wood thrush. And I, I love them because they have this like magical um, flute-like sound. They, 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 uh, you probably heard it if you've ever been in like a very intact oak beech forest. Um, these critters, uh, they, they, it's so wonderfully striking and beautiful. And, and the other morning, I, I was listening uh, with, with great amazement in Huntington, um, hearing for the first time a wood thrush singing from my backyard. And I was like, wow, I really hope he sets up a nest here. Um, it would be amazing. I would love to be serenaded by these, these birds uh, every morning. And really they sing throughout the day. Uh, and and when I when I got home later on, um, I came back from the office hoping to hear that my wood thrush was still hanging out. All I heard was an army of leaf blowers. Um, there was you know to the left of me, to the right of me, and then they got done with that one process and uh, that one yard and went next door. Um, and there's like ten uh, leaf blowers per yard. Drives me crazy, and it drives the ecosystem uh, you know to to death. Right, uh, you're blowing away. Uh, a, a critical lifeblood. Uh, I would be remiss not to talk about the stormwater benefits of leaf litter. It really helps buffer raindrops and, and to stop uh, soil molecules from being dislodged by the raindrops and kind of washing down the street and into uh, ultimately into the Great South Bay or wherever you know your your land is. Uh, but more importantly, uh, at least in the context of this webinar, is it's critical habitat. This is. Uh, this allows your birds to pop around your yard and flip up leaves and find uh, find bugs to eat in the in the middle of the winter. Um, this is where all of your pollen or a lot of your pollinators overwinter. So uh, if you sterilize your lawn with these terrible leaf blowers and get rid of all these leaves, uh, you're also getting you're throwing you're basically throwing out next year's crop of beautiful butterflies and pollinators and all the birds that that will feast on these pollinators if you allow them to emerge. Um, so, gosh, leave the litter. And if you have a place, a bed, you know, we, we talked a lot about quarter acre lots. Um, and so I kind of get it if you don't want your entire backyard to be covered with leaves. A good trick, at the very least, what you can do is take your leaf litter, um, mulch it up and put it back into your beds. Um, this way you don't have to spend money on this uh, horrible artificially dyed uh, mulch that you can get at Home Depot or, or you know, Lowe's or whatever, uh, use nature's mulch. And also it will, you know, it'll help suppress weeds. It'll add some nitrogen to the, back into the soil and it'll really help the soil build up over time um, and create incredible habitat. So leave the litter. Leaves are not litter. It shouldn't be called litter in my opinion. Um, and hey, an excuse to be lazy, avoid the, avoid the full cutback. All those uh, flowers that, that kind of have these, uh, seeds at the end of the year that you you know don't deadhead them the birds are going to come and eat the you know this is one of these the, like carolina wrens for example they don't really migrate they kind of just scrape and script uh they scrape by over the over the winter just by eating what's around and one of the key sources of, of food for them to sustain them over the winter are these seeds from the flowers that you deadhead just for it to be neat uh, and so and and you I see all these landscapers hacking back all the grasses. There's absolutely no need to do that. Um, the grasses, you know, next year, the greenery will kind of grow through. And, uh, you know, by this time, you could probably cut it back, but it's really critical habitat um, for wildlife. It supports uh, bugs. And, and I should say that the hollow stems of a lot of the plants that you would cut back are where a lot of our native bees, our solitary nesting bees kind of overwinter. Um, so, when you do the fall cutback and the fall cleanup, you're really uh, depriving nature of, of a place to live and really to scrape by. So please don't do that. And, and so um, it's, that's, that's it. Um, I, I, we should talk a little bit, um, uh, you know, maybe Robin, you want to kind of talk about this. Yeah. Hey, uh, the, you could actually just jump back to your last slide, Frank, because I would like to do our question and answers before we head into this. Um, I just want to say that um, people often ask, you know, what does what do bumblebees have to do with saving the Great South Bay? And, uh, and I think the point we're trying to get across here and through the Bay Friendly Yard webinar series is that native habitat uh, here on Long Island belongs here and it requires uh, less water and less maintenance and will uh, prosper without additional chemicals. 
um, because because it belongs here. And so this um, this all leads to, of course, an increase in our local biodiversity in the uh, the number of species that we can support here. But um, just as importantly, it um, it leads to a reduction in the use of um, chemical fertilizers uh, on our lawns, which lead to nitrogen runoff, which turns around and impacts greatly impacts the bay. And so that's the that's the connection between butterflies and and saving the Great South Bay. Yeah. Can um, I so add thanks. to that, Robin? Yeah. Yeah, Let please. Me just, I mean, that's such a great point, Robin. And and, and you're right. What do bumblebees have to do with the Great South Bay? Everything. Um, and, and the fun thing is that you can think of it in terms of um, putting green infrastructure to, to reduce stormwater management. You can think about it in terms of providing pollinator habitat. You can think about it in terms of restoring uh, structure and function for salamander species. Uh, it, you know, probably fewer people think about that than I do, but uh, <laughs> it's really just a different lens to view the same process. So everything that we're doing to create wildlife habitat, we create a butterfly garden to facilitate stormwater management, all these things that we're doing really are the same thing. And mm -hmm. all of those things will really help save the Great South Bay, especially if we all do a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Frank, is that these are things people often ask, well, you know, how can I help and what can I do to help save the Great South Bay? And and uh, the, the motto of our organization is start where you stand. You can start right in your own yard um, by creating um, or restoring a patch of of your lawn and and my home is as guilty as any anybody else's with the green lawn and like frank said i'm slowly um cutting off at the at the margins and reducing the lawn and adding um adding native species to uh and they're flourishing it's amazing my the little butterfly garden patch that i i ripped out some ornamental bushes from the fall last year and um and planted you know maybe 50 small plants uh, but they're they're flourishing this spring, and I'm I'm so excited to see the nature show that's going to arrive here soon on my very front lawn. So is Frank, we had a couple of questions um, yeah. in the Q and A that people were asking. So Beatrice Hahn asked, "Can the vertical layering apply to those of us who are in apartment living? Can we plant according to this description in potted plants also?" Uh, yeah, I don't see why. It's all about scale, right? I mean, so uh, you probably couldn't have a big oak tree in a pot, um, you know, obviously, but, you know, they, definitely you can, you can increase, you can facilitate layering by, you know, having one plant with a, you know, a tall, uh, I'm sorry, one pot with a tall plant, one pot with a smaller plant. And, and, and it's really, you can kind of create that diversity, uh, you know, especially if you, you can put them outside and, and use native plants. Um, there are a lot of native plants that would thrive in, in a pot situation. So, thank you. There was question, thank but, yeah. Um, there was a question from Martine. Um, can you give us a list of the most invasive species that are sold at the big box stores, I guess, in an effort to avoid them, as well as uh, suggestions of what are some of the best native plants that are sold at the big box stores? Or you can yeah. suggest that they avoid the big box stores <laughs> and go to a native planting nursery. Yeah, so, so you can, I always like to plug um, Kim at KMS Native Plant. She's great. She's like sort of a retail center. Um, obviously, Save the Great South Bay has our store. Um, Long Island Natives is, is a great source for, for local natives. And um, Decker's Nursery, I know in, in Northport has some. And there are, uh, there are native plant sales all, all over. But what I would say, and I'll get to the, there's like three questions in there. But I, I should say that um, ask your box store, um, you know, Everywhere you go, every single nursery you go to, ask them for their native plants. Um, and it really, we need to drive the demand. We need the demand to be such that box stores can't do anything but carry native plants. Otherwise, they'll lose out on huge market share. Um, so, so don't, you know, I wouldn't, I know some people feel differently and box stores aren't local business and so on. Uh, but if you're there, um, Ask them for native plants, buy their native plants, support the what they are doing, because that's going to really, uh, I, I think, over time help the ecosystem. Because truthfully, people will buy native plants by accident because they're equally beautiful. Um, and, and so that's a good transition to um, what to avoid and what to buy. Uh, a big thing to avoid is burning bush. I see this crap sold everywhere. Uh, it's, you know, and, and on the Long Island Gardening Group website, I see 
people say, oh, look how beautiful my burning bush is for one week in the fall. Uh, and, and this stuff is terrible because it creates berries. The berries are eaten by the birds. The birds fly off and poop in the woods. And now the, you know, uh, so much of Long Island has this cruddy plant in, in, the, uh, in the understory just because we plant it. And honestly, it's a really hideous bush for, you know, for most of the year anyway. You know, admittedly it's pretty for a week, but um, switch to blueberries. Uh, high bush blueberry is a good one. Uh, chokeberry, uh, maybe. Chokeberry is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, chokeberry yeah, choke is another awesome one. Good, good call, Robin. It turns a beautiful color in the in the fall. It has berries, and also this time of year, uh, they're like blooming and so beautiful. They're native bees all over the chokeberries I have in my yard. Um, so chokeberry is another good one. So you know, lose the burning bush. Uh, it, you know, we have to get over this like uncreative. We have five uh, plants that every landscaper plants in our yard and most of them, and a lot of them are destructive. Um, the other one to avoid is English ivy, for God's sakes, that stuff is everywhere. Drive along uh, the LIE or Southern State or any of our parkways on Long Island and, you, and just count the trees uh, that, are, that are just being, are, you know, slow death because of the English ivy. Um, and my guess is that you won't drive over you know, a mile and a half before you stop counting the trees because every tree has English ivy on it. Um, it's it's ugly and uh, the, the birds, again, they spread the berries. So don't buy English ivy, please. Uh, privet is another one. Uh, everybody, I've seen, it drives me insane. I've seen people say, oh, privet's important for the bees. The stuff is invasive. Uh, generalist bees might nectar on it, uh, but the native bees that they're really the ones that are in need of the most conservation, don't really they ignore privet and the stuff spreads everywhere um what other plant can i trash on i can uh, keep garlic going. mustard you can trash garlic mustard <laughs> garlic mustard is terrible it, fortunately uh, i haven't ever seen it sold anywhere uh that stuff you know so just a heads up if you remove english ivy what often proliferates underneath the english ivy is the garlic mustard and it, it's a really tough one um it, again it's not sold uh, a strategy for its removal Focus on those white flowers, the second year plants. Don't drive yourself nuts on the first year plants because you'll, you'll literally go nuts. Just make sure you, ha you have to defeat the seed bank over time. Uh, but that's not really a, a nursery stock plant that I see um, kind of sold. Uh, so, you know, I could, I could beat up on more plants, but, you know. Well, let's, maybe we could talk about some of the plants that we would like to see. Carol um, suggested barberry. Um, oh, that's another great one to beat up on, um, barberry. Uh, Japanese barberry, I see landscapers plant this all the time, commercial applications, uh, mm -hmm. single family homes. This stuff also spreads by berries and it's not that good looking and it's thorny and nasty. So mm -hmm. don't, please don't plant any barberry. Frank, would you spend a minute, uh, I know we've covered it in previous webinars, but um, uh, uh, talking maybe about some of the other ornamental plants that people plant and you know that they're beautiful and you know they may make your house look very nice, but they don't serve any ecological function. Where um, at the same time you can buy something and plant something that is equally beautiful, but serves an ecological function. I, I love that part of your talks where um, where you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So well, we mentioned the uh, and let's do let's try to do the invasive versus something nice, uh, just because the ornamentals, it's like planting. It's like a plastic piece of furniture outside, you know what I mean? For the functionally, uh, I mean, it might grow, it's kind of pretty, whatever. I'm not worried so much about ornamentals because they don't escape cultivation and, and impa impair uh, the, the health of the surrounding and adjacent forest. So I'm, I'm more worried about uh, some of the ornamentals, uh, uh, sorry, the invasive stuff. So, you know, instead of uh, Japanese barberry, uh, go with uh, nine bark, common nine bark. Um, and, and sometimes people like the Japanese barberry because they have that pur purple cultivar with the purple leaves. Forget the stupid stuff. It spreads everywhere. It's not that nice of a plant. There's a cult if you have to do, if you want purple leaves, there's actually a cultivar of uh, nine bark, common nine bark that has purple leaves um, and, it, and it is beautiful. Um, so, you know, my recommendation would be to plant, you know, for every cultivar you plant, plant like three of the straight species, but you know, nine bark instead of uh, barberry. Um, in terms of, of vines, uh, I, I see I see people, oh, the wisteria is so beautiful. Um, first of all, if you ever try to get rid of the stuff, you'll, you'll know how terrible it is. Uh, but instead of the, the wisteria, uh, look for coral honeysuckle. It's a beautiful uh, 
native plant. Uh, it's it's functionally evergreen, uh, and it, it is long and strong in terms of its its flowering. And, and the hummingbirds absolutely love it. It's so much prettier than wisteria, and the 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 critters that will visit the uh, the coral honeysuckle. Uh, will will really blow away anything that you see on the on the dumb wisteria flowers that's so terribly destructive. Um, you know what what else? Uh, what other terrible invasive plants were we trashing on? Oh, burning bush. We already mentioned chokeberry was Robin's excellent suggestion. There's a red chokeberry and a black chokeberry. Both of them are very pretty. Um, and high bush blueberry is another good one for the, uh, to get rid of the burning bush. And bonuses is that you get to uh, attract birds and you get to and maybe if you can beat the birds to it you'll have some blueberries uh, on, on your plant to, to eat and maybe feed to your feed eat with your kids um you know so we, we, can, we can keep going do, do you want to, or do you want to move on? <laughs> let's we have a couple of other questions so um sure. any suggestions for ivy eradication yeah um so first focus on what's going vertical that uh it doesn't it, so so for two reasons Number one, if it's going vertical, meaning climbing up the trees as opposed to on the ground cover, uh, clip it at the base of, of the tree. Don't try to yank it off the tree. It's, it's unnecessary and you'll ultimately, you'll actually hurt the tree because you'll um, kind of rip some of the bark off and, and allow for some pathogens like bacteria and fungus to come in and that which might ultimately hurt the tree. Um, so just clip it and you can watch with satisfaction as the uh, as the trees sort of the vines sort of melt off the trees and and the reason why I say focus first on on the what's on the trees is one because the English ivy represents slow and steady creeping death on the trees mm -hmm. every tree that you see with English ivy has a death sentence unfortunately um, so so save save the trees and give them a new lease on life also if you if you you'll notice this now. Uh, it doesn't really produce berries on the ground cover. It really only starts to produce berries as it goes vertical up the trees. And the berries are terrible because it, you know, the birds eat it, they can't help themselves, and they fly off and poop somewhere and, and more English ivy is spread. So, um, but you're, you're saving the trees and also saving the further spread of it. In terms of, um, in terms of the, the ground cover, uh, you really just have to have some, uh, some elbow grease. On, on certain applications, I'm able to get in like a mini excavator or even a bigger excavator, uh, which is, you know, obviously heavy equipment. Maybe every, uh, most homeowners won't have access to that stuff. Um, but certainly we do, we've, we've done that a lot uh, this year already where we're going in and literally ripping the stuff up with an excavator. Before you do that, check for turtles and wildlife and, and so on. Make sure you're not squishing anybody uh, with the excavator. But um, apart from the excavator, just pull and pull and pull. It's like an annoying game of tug, tug of war. But the but when you win that annoying game, you win um, an enhanced uh, ecological structure and function of your land. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so sure. much. Um, Bernadette asked, are all honeysuckle beneficial? Uh, I planted, she planted several in pots a while back. Um, no, in fact, a lot of honeysuckles are actually invasive. Uh, so Japanese honeysuckle, this terrible vine that's growing in all of our forested lands. As an aside, by the way, when, you, when people talk about, oh, it's overgrown and so on, typically what they're perceiving is the proliferation of invasive species in that area. Uh, and really, there's an inherent neatness to nature. Um, it's not an entirely organized neatness, but a neatness nonetheless. Think about intact, beautiful forests that you see. You see leaf litter on the forest floor, a shrub here, a shrub there, and, and, so, and so on. Really, when you see one plant crowding out an area, that forest is out of whack, and there's, it's usually an invasive plant that's doing that. Um, and one of the uh, bush honeysuckle, unfortunately, is a uh, horribly invasive plant. So if they're still in pots, kill them. And, um, and, and you could actually put like a little trellis in those pots with the coral honeysuckle, and you'll be rewarded with beautiful um, blooms in these cone-shaped uh, pink flowers that hummingbirds love. Um, you know, so, so sorry to burst the honeysuckle bubble, but please get rid of them. Yeah, I put it in the chat bar, um, the, uh, the link to the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. If you, when you enter your zip code there, it will give you listings of um, plants that are native to our area. And in particular, I love their Butterfly Finder, which um, identifies how many species each plant is a host to. It's, that's a really important um, piece because not all plants are created equal, right, Frank? Some yeah. plants play our, we call them hostess with the mostess. They, um, they will host hundreds of species of, um, of butterflies and other uh, creatures versus plants that host just a couple. 
So always, always, if you have to plant something, let's plant for the big bang for our buck. So Rebecca yeah, asks, what is the best way to create mulch from leaf litter if you don't have a lawnmower? Yeah, so uh, if you go online, there's like, uh, there's leaf litter, there's just leaf shredders, they're called. Um, and, and there's one for like $150 or so. Uh, it's sort of slow. You got to just put in a handful at a, at, at a time and make sure there's no sticks and it mulches it up for you and spits it out and you have some nice mulch. Uh, or you could hire somebody with an industrial shredder and they'll come in one day, suck up all the leaves, zoom, and they're, and they're all out. Uh, but, you know, if you have some time and some patience uh, and you want to steward your land, uh, I just there's the $150 one available online. And I think that's more than ad adequate for most applications. Terrific. Thank you. Um, one other participant asked, and I really love this idea. Uh, we're doing it already on a residential level, uh, but it, it might be an idea for us for um, uh, to develop, Frank. It seems to me that there should be an education program for landscapers, maybe bay-friendly certificates. Uh, we do have a list of, uh, and Frank has mentioned several of them here, um, nurseries that we work with, but it would be great to develop a list of landscapers who who um, in, incorporate bay-friendly techniques into their landscaping work. Yeah, yeah. so the Perfect Earth, pro, uh, Perfect Earth something. Project. I mean, Perfect Earth. Oh, yeah, Project um, has tried to do this. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I struggle with it personally. I, I have a company that does the ecological restoration, mm -hmm. um, but right now we don't have a maintenance division um, just because it's not, it's sort of hard uh, when I'm all over the long all over Long Island to kind of have you know sc scattered um, clients here and there. Uh, the the problem in a way is that um, this mow and blow sort of um, you know conveyor belt style of landscaping that we've become accustomed to uh, is really one of the, the better ways I guess to make a good living off of the landscaping, uh, and so you know you concentrate your routes around a single area, you know, three or four blocks in an area, you might have 20, 30, 40 houses and you go and hit one every 10 minutes or so. Um, and, and that's how a lot of people eco, eco living out of it. Um, and, and so um, if we could figure out how to, uh, to train these folks to better uh, steward their land in their process to rake instead of using a leaf blower, or if you have to use a leaf blower, at least use them uh, just to get it off the grass and, and put the leaves back into the bed and you don't need an army of them. You know what I mean? So it's, it's challenging, um, and it, but it really starts with the demand. The same, I had the similar answer about um, big box stores and native plants. If, if there's a, a, a lot of homeowners that are asking for uh, more careful stewardship of the land as opposed to maintenance, um, which is how it's framed now, people will start to evolve. Um, so, you know, tell your landscaper, use a rake, even if you have to charge me a little bit more. Um, you know, don't destroy my so soil column with your, with your darn leaf blower and please don't blow away my next year's crop of butterflies. Um, so, so educate so a perfect earth project is good uh, but really we need to start on uh, real all of our neighborhoods have to band together and demand um, better stewardship of the land and, and then the landscapers will adapt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Frank, uh, I'm going to start to wrap up it's about um, seven minutes to 11. can you head up to the next slide for us oh sure I just wanted to um, let people know that uh, Save the Great South Bay, we are a 501c3 nonprofit and, um, and Spadefoot Design and Construction is a native planting um, design company that design build. can yeah. do, um, can, <laughs> so that can do um, design and renderings. And for a, uh, for a $200 don uh, donate, I would say donation for $200, the proceeds of which go to the, to go directly to Save the Great South Bay to support our native planting programs and habitat restoration programs. Um, uh, Spadefoot will come out and actually design up to three areas of your yard. So if anybody's interested in that, it's yards at savethegreatsouthbay.org for information. Um, again, it's a $200 um, a charge for this service, but uh, that entire $200 goes directly to our organization to support um, our habitat restoration programs. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Robin. I feel I felt silly doing that, but- um, yeah, so so it's a way to give back to the to the organization that's doing such great work. You write, you know, we'll show up. You write the checks, right to save the Great South Bay. We're just there to support um, support your stewardship of the land, and and really grateful for the collaboration. 
Yeah, we are very, we're so grateful for the support. Um, and then if you just head to the next slide, Frank, uh, sure. we are, we, if you'd like to learn more, we, we host a monthly webinar series on Bay Friendly Arts. Next month, we're really excited to welcome Kristen, Dr. Kristen Parrott, and she will be uh, talking with us about uh, nature and mindfulness as we do, go into the summer months and, um, and ways that we can, we can find peace and serenity in our own yards. Um, so that is next month on Saturday, June 12th at 10 a.m. Uh, the Eventbrite will be posted, is already posted if you'd like to register. And um, and uh, we look forward to welcoming everybody. Frank, can you tell us um, on the on this uh, on the Spadefoot uh, support program for Save the Great South Bay, would you cover Riverhead on that? Uh, I mean, we're all over Long Island, so we'll make it work. It might be it might be somewhat of a turnaround time in us us getting out there to see the lawn, the the land. But yes, we'll do it. Yeah, or virtual, um, virtual. I love Zooms because they allow people to participate from many places. So maybe a remote uh, consultation could be in the way, could be, uh, could be there. So uh, I, with that, I, wait, there's one more Q&A. Let me see. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Beatrice, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to, we do host this monthly webinar series and, um, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much, Frank, for joining us and sharing all of your wealth of knowledge and experience with us. It's, it's always a pleasure to have you here uh, as our, our guest speaker on the Bay Friendly Yards webinar series. Yeah, and uh, okay, yeah, thank, thanks so much. My, it was my pleasure and look forward to seeing you all next month. Thanks, Frank. Goodbye, Goodbye everybody. Bye.